is critical beyond our imagination. There are two brothers that I really think work is fundamental for our liberation, and that's Professor Walter Williams and Dr. Gabriel Ebo. And I want to begin with Professor Oebo, because he's not here, but I just want to touch upon his work. His work become critical because of what Walter does for us. There is a difference between spirituality and religion. We are a spiritual people. Religion is man-made. It is not our nature. Our nature is exactly what it says, nature. It is what we are. It is our cosmic relationship with the cosmos, with the universe. And if you would just take a deep breath, the air that you breathe into your nostrils is the same air that's flowing in this room that flows uh, all over the world. It flows through you just like it flows through the trees. Every cell, every atom, that air is passing through. You drink the water, it goes through you just like it goes through the rivers and the branches and the creeks and the ocean. You are the water. Your body is sending to a more water just like it is you are the air. You eat the earth. You are the earth. Every time you eat, you're eating the elements from the earth in the plant, in whatever we're eating from the earth. And without the sun, you can't exist. The sun is the heat in your body. It's the same heat, the same sun. And you are the sun. And our ancestors understood this. And they had based their spirituality, their whole cultural society, civilization, was based upon this knowledge. And I just want to just throw one thing out so you can understand the importance of understanding our spirituality and religion, the difference between it. If you take a drop of water from the ocean, the mighty ocean, and put it under a microscope, every element in the ocean is in that drop. Every element is in that drop. But the drop can't give life to a fish. It can't float a boat. As a matter of fact, it dries rather quickly and evaporates. And that's the way we are. We are cosmic drops. Everything in the cosmos is in us. Gold, copper, zinc, all of them trace metals, magnesium, all of them. You try to do without them, and you see very soon your health will erode and you will start to perish. Because those elements in the universe must be current and active and working in your body. Now, if you take the drop of water that cannot give life to a fish and can't float a boat and put that drop back in the ocean, the drop becomes one with the ocean, and it is inseparable from the ocean, and it has all of the power and all of the dynamics of the ocean. When we as cosmic beings understand our cosmic reality and do what our ancestors did in ancient times, in ancient Kemet, Kemet uh, 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 Egypt, and become one with nature again, and that is to be with nature, to be one with nature. And the, the key to that is truth. Our ancient ancestors understood the way back home was balanced, was harmony, was one with nature, and truth gave them that. That's why the deity, my art, was in existence. I'm not your speaker for the night, but I wanted to lay out the difference between spirituality and religion. And what Walter does is show you how we created religion and why. 
we created religion. He takes the layers off of your mind, the psychological layers that have been put there by these religions and show you how they were put there, how they evolved. And in doing so, he frees you so that you don't need an intermediate. You are spiritual. Religion is man-made. And you know the Europeans lie about everything. They have wrote these books and wrote much of this history and lied, and the whole thing, you can't trust anything that Europeans have written in regard to history and culture and their worldview and your worldview. So Walter will unfold for us tonight a tremendous sweep of history. Brothers and sisters, without any further ado, I want to welcome a man who has done a tremendous work, an awesome work of liberation, Professor Walter Williams. Let's welcome him. Good evening. I want to say to you, may I hold tap? Uh, before we get started, I want to give a salute to my wife, Arnetta, who, with her love and devotion and her insight into history, uh, she was the one that really caused this book my new book, The Historical Origin of Islam, to come about at this moment. Other than that, it's been it's taken me a little longer to produce this book. But with her love and devotion and uh, stick to uh this book came out just yesterday. Okay? Uh, and uh, the first person on earth to buy this book was Brother Harold. Harold, yeah. Now, my wife, Arnetta, is seated in the back of this auditorium. Could you stand up, Arnetta? Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, as you know, I'm the author of the book called The Historical Origin of Christianity. This is my first book. This book's been out for 10 years. And the thesis of this book is that I'm saying that there's never been a man that ever walked the earth in human form of any race, creed, or color by the name of a Jesus Christ. Never existed. Okay? And I walk you through the history that created this European image and this man-made, dead religion, non-spiritual religion called Christianity. My second book that came out yesterday, which took me nearly eight years to write, called The Historical Origin of Islam. And I'm saying in this book, there's never been a man that ever walked the earth in human form by the name of a prophet Muhammad of tradition. Okay. Now, I'm not writing these books to offend anyone. That's not my purpose. I'm writing this book to bring information to our African community at this time in world history. And we, we, we vitally need the history that is written in both of these books. In order for us to be liberated 
we have to have knowledge. What happened to our ancient Egyptian ancestors in the past and what has to be done in the future. But if you don't know anything about the past, you don't know what to do in the future. See? So uh, this book, or these books are very, very vital to our community at this time in world history. Now tonight, I'm here to bring a liberating message to the people in the African community in New York City. And uh, if you understand this message that I'm going to lay out for you, then you can see yourselves, or we can see ourselves, on our way to be liberated. But it has to be done individually first, and then collectively thereafter, okay? by way of unification. Okay? So uh, I'm going to give you the phase or phases that we need to use to liberate us as a people. And you remember Willie Lynch? Everybody know about Willie Lynch. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, Willie Lynch came here in the United States of America in the latter part of the 18th century to talk to the slaveholders and owners in America about how to treat their Negro slaves. And he told them, if you use this method, this method can stay in place for 400 years and even 1,000 years. And that method that he taught the slave owners to use against our ancestors and us, because it's still being used today at this very moment, is still working. But we are going to break that. We're going to have to break that because, wow, we are at a crossroads in world history. When with the advent of 911, this country began to change. With what's going over, on over in Iraq at this very moment, this is causing the whole world to change. So therefore, we in the African community, we have to change too. And the thing about it, that these two books, The Historical Origin of Christianity, The Historical Origin of Islam, is written for one race of people only. See, I don't sell this book or these books in European bookstores. I don't sell them. They're in African bookstores. It's a message in these books for the African community. You see, I don't make a living selling books. You see, so I don't have to go and sell this book to everybody of any race, creed, or color. See, my message is geared to one group, one race, and that's the African nation and the African community in the United States of America and throughout the world. But we are going to have to change because the change is upon us. And the whole world is looking at us to make that change. You see, we are the Pied Piper of the world, regardless of what you may think as to who we are as a people. We are the pie type of why, because the whole world is following us. They're following us. Why do you think they have Soul Train on, on, the, on television all these years? Soul Train has been on television ever since, ever since it looked like ever since I was a little boy. OK? Don Cornelius got so old, his face dropped off. <laughs> huh? And, but Soul Train is there to teach white folks how to dance. Because if they didn't have Soul Train, you know, we, we, we invent and create dances every week. This week we're killing roaches, you know, squish, squash, you know. Next week we're doing electric slide, you know. <laughs> Next week we're doing the boogaloo, and, and so forth and on. So on. But they, so they can't keep up with us. So they have to have uh, something like Soul Train to be used as a demonstrator for them to keep up with our creativity. We are a great people. But now, 
we're going to have to do something about changing. And the change that I want to lay out will benefit us as a people. The first thing that we're going to have to do is to stop using and calling ourselves Negroes, Blacks, and African Americans. He said, see. See? Where are you going with the, the name Negro? Can you go to the world map and pick out Negro land on the world map? No. Can you go to the world map and pick out black man's land on that? No. Can you go to the world map and pick out African American land? It doesn't exist. You're talking about a non-existing, non-ethical, ethnic people. It's not there. Like uh, the great John Henry Clark used to say, if the name that you call yourself, if it cannot be applied to land, culture, and history, then you're talking about a non-existing people. You remember that? So you're going to have to stop calling yourself black people. You see, this is all over. Everybody using just black people. If you listen to, anybody listen to Tavis Smiley? Okay. You know, he's good at saying black folk. African American. Okay? But where, do, where does that take you back? To slavery. That's all. Slaved in America. You see? You pick up the Ebony, uh, Jet Magazine. Every other word is African American in there, or black. You're not going no place with that. All of your educators, they use the term African American or black. I've uh, uh, seen a lot of uh, so-called highly educated people on, on television saying that, oh, uh, uh, we are Afro-American. Afro-American? Afro is a hairstyle. So how can you be from a hairstyle? Where, where can I look on the world map and pick out Afro-Americans from? It's not there. See? So we're going to have to understand what we are doing to ourselves with the names that we are using. Now, I was uh, giving a lecture in uh, last month in February uh, in Washington, uh, Seattle, Washington, Tacoma, Washington, uh, and then I was in Portland, Oregon. Now, the host that brought me in, I was explaining to him about the names that we are calling ourselves and how, uh, how damaging these names are such as uh, Negro, Black, and African-American. Well, minority is another subject. Okay. That goes into another, another subject. But I say, uh, you're going to have to train yourself. You're going to have to go into the bathroom every, every morning and look in the mirror and say, I am an African ancient Egyptian. That's what you're going to have to say. Okay? I am an African ancient Egyptian. Why? It takes us back to our greatness. We're going to have to resurrect ancient Egypt and claim ancient Egypt. Okay? We cannot be an Egyptian. Now, don't let nobody call you an Egyptian and don't you call yourself an Egyptian. Because anyone of any race, creed, or color can be an Egyptian. The Arabs over there now, those white Arabs, they are Egyptian. The Chinese can be an Egyptian. Puerto Rican can be an Egyptian. Indian of India could be an, an Egyptian. All you have to do is stay over in Egypt for a certain length of time or be born over there, and you're an Egyptian. Okay? Like anybody can be an American over here in this country. Of any race, creed, or color. You can be an American. But you cannot be an ancient Egyptian unless you are qualified to be an ancient Egyptian. And you know what qualifies you to be uh, identified and called an ancient Egyptian, you have to be African. That's the qualification. You see? You have to be an African. So don't say, I'm an Egyptian. Say, I'm an ancient Egyptian. Because ancient Egypt is lying in the continent of Africa, unclaimed at this very moment that I'm talking to you. Unclaimed. And here we are, 
40 million or more of us living in this hemisphere in North America without any ethnic identity, none whatsoever. So the globe fits perfect. We cannot go any place. I'm talking about us living in North America. We cannot go to any place in Africa and claim our greatness. It's not there. I'm not trying to knock anybody or Africans. They are brothers. We love them. But you cannot, we from North America cannot go into Africa and claim no place on the African continent and say, I'm home. Can't do it. But there is a space for us, a place for us that's been waiting for us to claim for years and years and years and years and years. And that's the civilization and culture of the ancient Egyptians. The world's greatest people that has ever walked this earth. Okay? During the time of antiquity, they, they were the only people on earth that had a writing system. They were the only people on earth that were literate. They had three forms of writing, metanatural hieroglyphics, the hieratic phonetic one alphabet, and the demotic phonetic two alphabet. And whoever creates an alphabet That alphabet can only be created one time. So they were the first ones to create a writing system and an alphabet. See? So therefore, uh, they were the only literate people on planet Earth. No other races of people throughout the whole entire world could read or write because they didn't have an alphabet, including the Greeks and the Romans. The Greeks never had an alphabet. That's never been an institution that ever came out of Greece. Why? In order to have an institution, you have to have a writing system. The Greeks were uncivil, uncivilized savages coming into and during the time of the invasion of ancient Egypt. See? Now, George G.M. James put out a book and said that the Greeks studied with the ancient Egyptian. That's not true. Because the ancient Egyptians did not take foreigners into their society. They didn't do that. They didn't take foreigners into their sacred society. Okay? So therefore, they did not study with the ancient Egyptians. But they did study with the Coptic Egyptians. Where? In the world's first Christian church put up by Justinian and his wife Theodora in Constantinople, which is northeast Africa, misnomer today and called the Middle East. They studied there at the world's first Christian church and the world's first university for the European. But the teaching staff at the Hagia Sophia were staffed by Africans, Coptic, Melkite, Egyptian, Africans. That's who taught the Europeans. But this was, this was in the 6th century, in the middle of the 6th century. That's when it happened, after 537. See? But not when Alexander the Greek came into Egypt. You see? So uh, when Alexander the Greek came into Egypt, he forced the Greek language on our ancient Egyptian ancestors. And by them being a literate people, they applied one of their alphabet to the Greek language. So the Greeks never had an alphabet, but it was the language, the Greek language that an alphabet was applied to. So today, as a misnomer, they say, oh, this is the Greek alphabet. Greeks never had no alphabet. See? So we have to understand who our ancestors are. I didn't say a word, are. You see, they teach you in these various universities that there was a Socrates. And Socrates was supposed to be the teacher of Plato. And Plato was supposed to be the teacher of Aristotle. And that there was a Herodotus. And that there was a Homer. That there was a Salon. And that there was a Pythagoras, etc., etc. All these Greek names supposed to have existed prior to Alexander the Greek coming into Egypt in 332 BCE. 
I, Walter Williams, come along and, and challenge anybody who claimed that there was a Socrates, a, a Plato, an Aristotle, a Herodotus, Homer, etc., etc. Why do I challenge that? I challenge that because I ask one question. If you're going to say that these Greek names existed, then you tell me what alphabet did they use to write with? Because the Greeks had no alphabet. There was only one race of people having an alphabet on planet Earth. And those people are known to us today in history as the ancient Egyptians. These are our ancestors, but we have to know something about our ancestors in order to be spiritually and racially in tune with them. They are waiting for us to claim them in the continent of Africa. They are waiting for us to come and make that claim. They are unclaimed. The ancient Egyptian culture and civilization is unclaimed in the continent of Africa, why? Because the descendants of the ancient Egyptians have been taught away from ancient Egypt. How do they teach you away? They, they name you and train you as a Negro. They uh, allow you to come up and call yourself black. James Brown did it. He said he's black and he's proud. And they had a little dance to go with it. See? Then Jesse Jackson come along and uh, told white folks, say, call us African American. He said, fine, beautiful. As long as you do not call yourself an ancient Egyptian, they'll call you whatever you suggest that they call you. See? They want to keep you away from that greatness. Because why? Your ancestors, the ancient Egyptians, civilized this whole entire world. Everything that you see around you came from the culture and the civilization of our ancestors, the ancient Egyptians. Everything. Paper, pen, ink. Domesticating the earth, domesticating the animals, living in brick buildings, science, mathematics. It goes on and on and on and on. They civilized this whole entire world, planet that we call world today, whereby the Europeans terrorized this whole entire planet. Every inch of this earth has been terrorized by the Europeans. He's over there at this very moment terrorizing the people in Iraq. He's right there. He even terrorized his own folk. Now I'm going to tell you something else. Now you listen to this. The European or Europe has never been invaded by no one or nobody of any race, creed, or color. Never invaded Europe. Don't tell me about a Hannibal now, because there's never been a Hannibal. But that's another subject. Okay? But no one or nobody of any race, creed, or color has ever, ever invaded Europe. But the Europeans has invaded every people, every culture, every race on planet Earth, including himself. It's something to think about. See? So we are going to have to resurrect ancient Egypt. And I was telling Brother Clemson Brown, and I'm going to tell Clemson again, Clemson, from this day on, you cannot use black people anymore, that term. You're going to have to use ancient Egypt or ancient Egyptians. African ancient Egyptians. Don't use that because you're not helping us as a people. You're setting us back. Every time you say black people, you're sending us back to slavery. Every time you say that African American, you're sending us back to slavery. Every time they use the term Negro, they're sending us back to slavery. But when you say that I am an African ancient Egyptian, what are you doing? I'm sending you back to the, to the greatest people and the greatest civilization and the greatest culture that has ever existed on planet Earth. That's what I'm doing. And you can claim that because we are an African people and the ancient Egyptians are an African people. I didn't say we're Africans. They still are Africans. Now, if you have to understand that, that's your first phase of us understanding and coming back to the forefront to liberate us as a people. That's what we're going to have to do. 
see, see, they won't have me on, on public television because I'm going to get and I'm going to use the term African, ancient Egyptian. They don't know what the hell I'm talking about. You see? So you will never, ever hear me use that word or call my brothers and sisters in the African community black. Never do that. Something have you ever heard me use that term? I don't use that term. You would never ever hear me use the term African American. I wouldn't call you dare call you an African American. I'm degrading you. I would never call you a Negro unless I'm mad at you. <laughs> and I'm do, I'm calling you a Negro to be nice to keep you from calling you a nigger. See? That's a scholarly word. Oh, Yo, he's a, another Negro. See? So uh, we're going to have to come back for our liberation. In order to do that, you're going to have to understand what it takes for us to be liberated and how we can go about liberating us. That's the first phase now. Are you following me? Now, the second phase of our liberation. It may hurt a little bit, so I got to bring it to you. You know what that is? We're going to have to divest ourselves from all religions. Okay? I don't care what you may think of Reverend C.T. Chicken Wing, your, your local minister. I don't care what you think of your imam. Okay? I don't care what you think of your uh, blood of Abraham leader. It has nothing to do with that. It has something to do with you. The liberation of you individually as a human being. That's what it has to do with. So therefore, we're going to have to divest ourselves from all religions. Okay? and find our way back to our own indwelling personal spirituality. Now this is very, very simple. Okay? Very simple. No human on earth was born with a religion. Nobody came here. No, no Christian. No Muslim. No black Hebrew Israelite. No Jew, no Buddhist, none of that. If you don't believe it, go and get your birth certificate. If you look on your birth certificate and see if there's Christian on there, a Muslim on there, it's not there. So in order for you to liberate yourself and divest yourself from all these uh, chaotic religions, you must know who you are spiritually. Now I'm going to tell you who you are. Now you listen to this. If you understand what I'm about to tell you, then you will be liberated for the rest of your life and you won't owe me a dime. Okay? And I'm not trying to sell you a book. I'm not trying to do that. You want to buy the book? Fine. You buy it for your own self. Don't buy it because you're thinking you're helping me. No. Uh-uh. Buy it because the information in this book will help you. Okay? But I'm going to tell you, so you understand what I'm about to tell you, then you will be liberated for the rest of your life. And it's very simple. Now listen. No human on earth was born with a religion. Do you agree? Every human on earth was born and created by a creator or creatress that you your mother and your father as human instruments to bring each and every human on earth to this earth in human form. Do you understand that? And your creator creatures, after using your mother and father as human instruments to bring you forth into this world as a human being, never gave you a religion. They gave you no religion? Gave you an indwelling spirit that's indwelling inside of you at this very moment that I'm talking to you. Do you understand that? It was man who gave you the religion. 
every human that was born is hooked up to the universe. Their spirituality is hooked up to the universe by way of their pineal gland. Every human has a pineal gland. It serves as a receiver and a sender between you, the human being, and the universe. The bottom of your pineal gland are your nostrils. What do you do with your nostrils? You intake air to keep that indwelling spirit alive inside of you. Is that right? Are you following me? Your pineal gland is a conduit. It serves as a receiver and a sender between you, the human being, and the universe. See, like this building here, they have conduits, electrical conduits, running all over this building. And if you want power, you go there and plug in whatever you want to plug in to one of those outlets, and you get power. Every human is plugged into the universe that way, by way of their pineal gland. So the power was given to you at the time of your birth, your spiritual power. You see? But these religions come along and they rob you of that. See? They are, all religions are nothing but thieves. That's all it is. You see? And the first thing that they tell you and ask you, do you believe in God? doesn't matter because God is man-made. So it doesn't matter. See, people are being imposed on when they are little children in their innocence by their parents. And their parents was imposed on themselves by their parents with a religion. You see that? So therefore, in your innocence, you can't tell your mother or father, say, Mom, Dad, I don't want to be no Christian. Mom, Dad, I don't want to be no Muslim. Don't do that to me. You can't, you, you, you know, you, you can't tell them that because you're in your innocence. You see? But here they come, taking you down to old Reverend C.T. Chicken Wings Church, introducing you to Chicken Wings, and he is going to impose and a religion on you. Next thing you know, you got a great big old cross around your neck. Singing in the choir, there is room at the cross for you. And you don't know, how did, how did you get there? You, <laughs> what happened? Huh? You, 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 see, you see what I'm saying? You know, now, then they tell you, do you believe in God? They ask you, do you believe in God? Quite naturally, people are going to say yes. Because if you said, no, I don't believe in God, they say, well, uh, Clemson Brown, he's, he's odd, he's strange. Huh? So no one wants to be strange and odd. They say, yes, I believe in God. They don't know any better. But see, when you believe in God, they got a religion for you, buddy. <laughs> The next thing that follows is a nice, fat religion. See? Now, I told you you're going to have to divest yourself from all religions. Is that correct? You're going to have to do the same thing with God. Do not worship or believe in God. God has no power outside of religion. You see that? I'm going to tell you why. Inside of religion, God has power. Who gives God power? You, the believer, when you believe in God. You give God all of your spiritual power that was given to you free at the time of your birth by the creator creatures who use your mother and father as human instruments to bring you forth in this world. You give all of that uh, power, that spiritual power that you have to God. And God is a man. If you don't believe that God is a man, every time you say the word or use the term God, you say he. 
his or him. Is that correct? So God is a man. You go and, and look at a program called Touched by an Angel. You seen that program? They tell you, say, uh, God, he loves you. It's he. It's always a he. You see? And then no one has ever seen God, but this, but this only God that you have seen is this European white image. That's the God that you have seen for Christianity. See? So God is a man. God has no spiritual power whatsoever. My wife came to me one day and says, Walter, I'm going to tell you something about God. She says, now listen to this, it's very profound. She said, God is an abstract idea that needs human spirituality to give it life. Without you, the human being, giving God life, God will not have life. You cannot take God outside of religion. God has no power outside of religion. And then another thing, why would you reduce all of the creation around us, the, the sun, the moon, the sky, the stars, air, water, earth, animals, plants, and humanity, down to one man. Down to one man now. And this one man, she reduced it, God down to, is a white man. Something's wrong with you. What is wrong with you people? Wake up. Huh? When you embrace a religion, guess what you are doing to yourself? You are out of tune with the universe. You're not in tune with the universe when you go around talking about I'm from the blood of Jesus and Islam alaikum and all that foolishness. I'm from the blood of Abraham. Never been no Abraham. How can you be from the blood of, of a biblical character that never existed and walked on earth? How can you do that? That's total ignorance. Now, the reason why people do that is because they don't know who they are spiritually, what they were born with. If you understood what you were born with, you would never, ever allow anybody to come up to you with a religion. You said, no, 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 it's okay. Uh -uh, no, leave me alone. Go away. Take your little religion with you. Okay. Don't want it. Why? Because you know who you are spiritually. Everything was given to you at the time of your birth that you would need to sustain yourself for the rest of your life spiritually by and given to you by the creator creature. Gave you everything that you would need to sustain yourself spiritually for the rest of your life. So here you are, uh, out of ignorance, out of tune with the universe, talking about I'm uh, walking in the blood of Jesus. You know, that's, that's, that's ludicrous. Now here you, uh, another thing. Suppose Jews went into a synagogue and they had a great big old picture of Adolf Hitler on the wall. Talking about how Hitler. People around the world were laughing at them. He said, what damn fools they are. Here's a man so annihilated them, put them in the ovens and everything. They're talking about bow down to Hitler. You see that? You don't need that. You don't, look, don't believe in God. People ask me, say, do you believe in God? I said, no. I don't believe in no God. Why do I not believe in a God? Because I know who I am spiritually. I know who I am. I know power that I have. I know if I believe in God, then God robs me of my power. Because God is a man. Okay? Made in man's own image. Not the reverse. So I'm not going to give my power away to some God. Or no God. I, who do you believe in? I believe in Walter Williams. That's who I believe in. Okay? Now, I'm not an atheist. I know that I am a spiritual human being. Okay? I know that there's a higher power than Walter Williams. I'm not a fool now. I know that there's a higher power than Walter Williams. Okay? I know that something made me, that something that made me, I don't know. And no human on earth can tell you how they got here on earth in human form. Okay? How much 
education you have, how much money you have, and what station in life you hold. You cannot tell me how you got here. You only found yourself here at a conscious memory in your mind. Now, me, Walter Williams, I can go back to about four or five years old. I remember when my grandfather made me a toolbox for my little tool. Now, from zero to four or five, I have no conscious memory of Walter Williams. Now, I, at four or five years old, find myself living in a certain geographical land area on Earth, and that was Chicago, Illinois. I found myself, between four and five years old, belonging to a certain race of people, the African race. Okay? Now, that's, that's all I know about myself, consciously. Now, before, from zero to four or five, I, I have no conscious memory of myself. So now, you can multiply my experience with every human on Earth of all races, creeds, and color. See? So, but you have to accumulate that type of knowledge by studying, thinking, unclogging your artery from all these various religions about God and so forth and so on. Now, if you took God and threw God in the garbage can, if you took this dead white man on the cross and took this dead white man called Jesus the Christ and put that thing into the garbage, if you took that silly Bible that has no historical worth whatsoever and threw it in the, in the garbage, now what will be standing there? You, the human being, with all of your spiritual power and spirituality intact. You won't die. No lightning bolt will come down and strike you. Huh? But you, what you're doing, you're getting all that garbage out of your life. See? In other words, you should be able to give yourself a spiritual enema. You see? You, you know, there's a couple of ways you can give yourself an enema. You can go and get a dish bag and put a little soapy water in there and you know what to do from there. I won't tell you what to do, but you know. <laughs> and let it all come out. Or you can get a professional. Call on it. You see? And they'll do all that for you. And let you see it come out on the screen. And say, hey, see? Look. It's coming for all that. God is coming out. The Bible, the dead white man with the cross is coming out. All of that is coming out of you. See? You don't need that in your life. Get rid of it. See, when you embrace a religion, guess what religions will do for you? It will give you side effects. You have side effects. You see, but if you got sick and went to the doctor, and the doctor is going to diagnose your ailment, and he is going to write out a prescription for some type of medicine. Is that correct? And the medicine that he is going to prescribe is going to give you side effects. That's what it's going to do. Why? Because it's man-made synthetic medicine. That's what's going to, that's what's going to happen to you. So when you ingest a man-made religion, these re religions will give you side effects. The first side effect is confusion. Why are you confused as a human being? Because you don't know who you are spiritually. That's where the confusion comes in. I don't know who I am. So therefore, I've had people say, you know, I've been uh, uh, searching for a religion all my life. And I've decided to be a Jehovah Witness. <laughs> okay? Now, why would you, if you knew who you are spiritually, you wouldn't be going around looking for no religion to give your spirituality away. Just give it all your spiritual power. Oh, yeah, I want to be a Jehovah Witness. Oh, I want to be a Baptist. Okay, I want to be a black Hebrew if you like. I want to be a Muslim. Just give it away. That's out of ignorance. So therefore, confusion is the first side effect when you ingest and take in a religion. The second side effect is that religion, all religions, Limits your thinking. Limits your thinking. You agree to that? 
I'm going to show you. Now, you remember Heaven's Gate, that group called Heaven's Gate? The old, constipated-looking white man had these people following him. And he told, <laughs> he told the male members of his congregation to cut off their penis. Huh? You remember that? Wait now. You may tell me that <laughs> you are going to follow somebody and let them entice you to cut off your genitals. Huh? How are you going to do that? Huh? You have a problem. Huh? That's all you got. That's all you got is, is, is your penis. One of the things, anyway. And if you, if you lose that, you're out of commission. It's over. But these fools went there and got them the biggest scissors, a pair of scissors they can find, pulled their penis out, kick, snatch it off. Following this old, constipated white man. Huh? Some of we're going to, and then laid in the bed and all died to go up into heaven. There's supposed to be a blimp up there now. You remember that? And they're all supposed to go and ascend up into heaven to be with God, be with the Lord. But see, I don't want to be with the Lord. Damn the Lord. Okay? <laughs> I'm not going to do that. See? Because I can think. See? You remember Jim Jones? Huh? You remember Jim Jones? Those had those people following him because he looked like Jesus. Huh? Had him out there. In, in, in Vienna, drinking Kool-Aid. Sinai. Huh? Can't think. You mean to tell me you, uh-uh, you can't do that to me. I can think. David Koresh is another one they follow. See? All these white boys who come up with their grand ideas that they're Jesus. <laughs> Here we come falling behind them. You see that? Now, let me tell you about Right here, in, right in Chicago, my hometown, there's a, a, a minister by the name of Reverend E. D. Teeny Weeny. <laughs> Reverend Teeny Weeny told told his parishioners. Now you listen to this. He told his parishioners, not. <laughs> Reverend E.D. Kingwini. <laughs> Told his parishioners to listen. <laughs> Told his parishioners to listen. I want you to, to, to sell all your worldly goods. Sell your house. Quit your job. This is true. Quit your job. Go down to the public aid and tell your worker that you don't need no more public assistance anymore. Turn in your food stamps. You don't need that anymore. And I want you to be at this church at 11 o'clock on Thursday. Gave him the date and everything. This is true. This is Kenny when he was on television. And they said, we're going <laughs> we're gonna to all ascend and go up to heaven and be with the Lord. At 12 midnight. So the parishioners, they don't sold everything. They had no homes to go to. They emptied out their bank account. They gave away their food stamps. They gave all of their worldly goods away. They have no job, nothing. They go on to be with God, be with the Lord. 12 o'clock came. Nobody died. One o'clock came, nobody died. Two o'clock came, nobody died. And there's Reverend Teeny Winnie sitting over there, looking just like Pi Pooty. Now you can imagine how Pi Pooty looked. Reverend Teeny Winnie looked exactly like Pi Pooty, like a damn fool. And the people there following him, they're damn fools too. 
Huh? This, but this, this is what these religions will do for you. It limits your thinking. You see that? Now, another thing. They tell the Christian that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to save the world from sins. Is that correct? Now, wait now. Something's wrong with this. Now, wait now. It says that God sent his only begotten son. Now, only. That means nobody else can be a son of God but this one son. And this one son is a European white man. Huh? That means that Clemson Brown cannot be the son of God. That means I can't be the son of God. I'm so glad, but I can't be the son of God. You can't be the son of God. No one in this male in this room can be the son of God. Why? Because your skin is too dark. You're not white. Your eyes are not blue. Your hair is not long and blonde and straight. Okay? So therefore, God is a bigot. It's a racist. Huh? And you sit up there in the pews and let old Reverend C.T. Chickenwing tell you these lies about God so loved the world that he sent his only by God and son. See, and you don't even question and say, wait, Reverend, something's wrong with that, brother. I can't buy that. Something's wrong. It's racist. But you're telling me that God is a bigot. That's all, you, that's all you're saying. You see? Then they tell the females that you females were made, not created, but made from the rib of a man. And you sit up there in the pews and don't even challenge Reverend Chicken Wing. So, Reverend, I don't believe that what you think. Don't tell me that. Something's wrong with that. You know what Reverend will tell you? Your sister, uh, I'm going to pray for you. Huh? Something's wrong with that. Why would you let somebody tell you that? You know any females that have been born from the rib of a man? Without the female, there wouldn't be no man. They have a damn rib. Huh? Let's, let's be for real. But they tell you all this foolishness. Then they tell, the, this is what they tell the, the Muslims. They tell the Muslims that the angel Gabriel taught the prophet Muhammad the entire Quran. That the angel Gabriel was bringing a message from God to give to the prophet Muhammad. And the prophet Muhammad being illiterate, that he memorized the entire Quran by memory and then dictated to a scribe. Now, when you investigate, like I did, I investigated to find out who in the hell is the angel Gabriel. You know what I found out? Who? Is it who? No, no, no. Okay, you must hear my, my tapes or something. But anyway, who said it's a bird? Is that Fanny? That's right. The angel Gabriel is a little bird. Do you know a little bird teaching anybody anything? Suppose you had bird teachers at the city college here. You go into your classroom, there's a bird sitting up there. Hi, class. You know, my name is Tweety. <laughs> huh? I'm Professor Tweety. It's a little bird. Huh? Now, when you investigate who taught the angel Gabriel, guess who it is? Who said, go ahead? Who? Who? The, the, the Israfil, the angel Israfil, the six-tongued Herod monster. And they tell these Muslims these things, and they don't question nothing. They believe it. Six-tongued Herod monster called Israfil, one of the angels of Islam. Okay? Taught the angel Gabriel. See? And they... They believe this. They believe it without question. 
Now ask no question, just believe. See, when you believe, that becomes very dangerous to believe in something that you know nothing about. See, I want you to remember this. A belief does not give you knowledge. Remember that. Belief does not give you knowledge. Only facts will give you knowledge if you look for the facts. But in order to get the facts, you have to pick a subject and begin to collect information pertaining to that subject. And all the gathered information that you, that you pick, inside of that gathered information will be facts. And that's what you pluck out of it. See? But believing does not give you knowledge. You see? So these people going around, it's not more like them. They don't know what they're talking about. Like them so long, they don't know nothing about that. Prophet Muhammad, they don't know nothing about the Prophet Muhammad. You see? So, Stop allowing these religions to make damn fools of you. Think. Question. Don't let nobody just come up and tell you anything. You are too intelligent for that. You cannot allow that to happen to you anymore. Okay? Then they tell the black Hebrew Israelites and the Muslims that Abraham was Woke up one morning, and he was horny. He was horny. And he wanted to have a baby. He went to his wife, Sarah, and said, Sarah, I, uh, I want you to have a baby for me. She said, man, I'm 85 years old. I can't have no baby days. is over with. This is how the story, this is how the traditional story goes. They say, she said, you go and get your handmaiden, Hagar. And she will have a baby for you. Now, mind you, this is Abraham, 100 years old. And he's horny. But now, they didn't have no Viagra back then. Okay? No Viagra. But all of a sudden, he's, he, he's got a hold of Hagar. And he, here comes a baby from Hagar named Ishmael. You know, the Muslims love to twist their mouth all them to Ishmael. Like it's so grand, Ishmael. Uh, see? And then it goes on to say that Sarah somehow mustered up enough strength to have a baby for him by the name of Isaac. And you know the story from there. But nobody questions that. They believe that. You see, they believe that. Without question. Okay? This is what they are doing. So just limit your thinking, these religions. Stop allowing these religions to limit your thinking. Divest yourself from all religions. The third side effect that these religions will give you it will give you and make you animate these various religions in your subconscious mind. Now, where is your subconscious mind? Right in your midsection. That's your feeling section. That's where your love for others and yourself comes from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. See? So these, now, how, how, how do you uh, animate these various religious supposed events. When Reverend C.T. Chicken Wing tells you about Jesus got crucified on the cross, okay? And you can see in your mind now the crucifixion of Jesus Christ carrying his cross on Calvary. Is that right? You begin to animate that. Is that right? Because that story has superimposed on your subconscious mind. And you become the animator. You see? And then when they tell you at Christmas time that this Jesus was born in a manger, that Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem 
And the innkeeper said, we have no room for you in the inn. And they went out and they found a manger. And three wise men appeared from the east, bearing gifts to this baby Jesus. Now, you begin to animate that. You see? You become the animator. That's right. You know, in Chicago, on Saturday mornings, the television is loaded with animated cartoons for the kids. And you see horses talking and dogs. Oh, hi, Mike. Can you come out to play? See? But they, <laughs> they're animals, animated. We do the same thing when you embrace a religion. You become the animator. That's your third side effect. The fourth side effect is fear. They tell you if you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to die and go to hell. Your soul is going to burn up. They tell you that. It's fearful. Make you fear. You go and grab that Bible. See? You start coming to it. You get that cross with that dead white man on you. You see? I got to get close to Jesus. The old Reverend Chicken Ring. Uh, all that emotional foolishness. You don't need that in your life. Huh? <laughs> okay, I heard that. You don't need that in your life. What do you need with a religion in your life? Were you born with a religion? Huh? Let me hear you loud. Okay then you need to divest yourself of all religion, and this is what's going to help liberate us as a people. Know who you are spiritually. What spiritual power was given to you at the time of your birth? Unify that power together with each other. See? Now, Reverend Chicken Wing can take his church and turn it into a spiritual learning consciousness center. But he's got to take church down from the building. He's got to take a dead white man on that cross down from the building. He's got to take every Bible that he can find and, and, and sit it down in, uh, uh, and throw it in the garbage can. That's what he's going to have to do. Okay? He's got to do that. Okay? So, uh, what I'm saying to you I gave you two phases of our liberation. Is that correct? If you understand that, and if you use those two phases and teach it to your children, and, th and, and their children will teach it to their children, and on and on and on in the future, we will have a different people on earth. We will be a different people. Then the world will look at us with a different eye. You see, like I mentioned before, we are the Pied Piper. The world is following us. You see? Every time we go to the bathroom, they are there with a big net to catch it and then take it back to the laboratory and see what the, what the Negroes did today. You see? See if they can learn something. See? See, then, then again, we, as Negroes, term which I don't use, but if these white folk have put this Negro stuff on us, we are the greatest Negroes that has ever walked this earth. And you think about that. We are still the greatest people that ever walked this earth, right at this very moment that I'm talking to you. Huh? No, no they can't beat us. Can they out tap dance us? Huh? Can they out basketball play, play us? Huh? Can they out uh, golf us? Can they out tennis us? Can they out box us? Huh? Can they, can they out play music better than we can? Can they, can they dance better than we can? No. They can't sing. They can, everyone, you look at the American Idol, everyone knows. Oh, my kids get up there. They, they got to go to. Negro 101, and learn how to sing. Got to take lessons. 
and they come out there without, they speak in one way, oh, hi there, and I, uh, so and so, and you know, and then they get out there and say, oh, baby, wait, hold it, what happened? Their voice, they don't change their voice. Huh? Is, that, is that right? See? So we are the greatest Negroes that has ever walked this earth. Great people. But we don't, we don't have to be Negroes because there's no such thing. Who are we? We are descendants of the greatest people that has ever walked this earth, known to us today in history as the ancient Egyptians. And when you go and resurrect and claim ancient Egypt, then you will be identifying with yourself, with the greatest people that's ever walked this earth. See, the descendants today are not claiming ancient Egypt. The Ethiopians, they're descendants of the ancient Egyptians, but guess what they call themselves? Ethiopians. As long as they call themselves an Ethiopian, what happens? Ancient Egypt is lying unclaimed in the continent of Africa. You see that? The next descendant is the ones that live in the Sudan. You see them today? Say, who are you? I'm a Sudanese. When he says that he's a Sudanese, that means that what? Ancient Egypt is lying unclaimed in the continent of Africa. The next descendant is the Nubians. When you see the Nubians, you say, you say who are you? I'm a Nubian. That means that ancient Egypt is lying unclaimed in the continent of Africa. When my group went over into Egypt in 1992. A plane landed in Cairo, Egypt. And when we landed in Cairo, Egypt, the Nubian, as we descended the airplane, began to greet us. Americans, Americans, I'm Nubian. You're my Nubian cousin. I said, wait, hold it. I said, I. I'm an ancient Egyptian, and you're my ancient Egyptian cousin. He says, no, 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 I'm Nubian. Now, that told me that this Nubian, living in Egypt, waking up every morning, looking at the greatest edifice that's ever been built on earth, the Sphinx, and the pyramid, don't identify with ancient Egypt. And, and, and he he is either a Christian or he's a Muslim. That's a damn shame. <laughs> you think about that. And this ring, I have a, a, my wedding band that my wife gave me. On this wedding band is a ring of Ankh. See, it's like it's beautiful. The brother right here in New York named Shamaz made this ring for my wife so she can give it to me as a wedding band. And when he went to Egypt, you know, you remember you see on, 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 in those books depict, depicting the ancient Egyptians, you see the ark that the ancient Egyptians would carry. He carried one in Egypt when he was there. You know, he said that the Nubians came up to him and asked him, what's that? What's that? That's me. Huh? They didn't even know. They are, listen, the Nubians over there in Egypt is worse off than the Negroes here. They live over there looking at the Sphinx and, and, and the pyramids every day. They don't even know who they are. Won't claim it. So ancient Egypt is, 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 is lying in the continent of Africa unclaimed because the descendant has been taught away from ancient Egypt. We in this country, in North America, have been taught that we were Negroes. Then we began to call ourselves black, and we are proud to be black, okay? And then Jesse Jackson came along and said, we are African Americans, and so forth. And so here we are today. You're still black, still an African American, and you're still a Negro, but where are you going with that? Huh? Where are you going with it? You're going back to slavery, see? Going back to slavery. Black History Month, they call it Black History Month, February. They don't tell you that you, that we are descendants of ancient Egyptians. They don't tell you that. I'll tell you about Sojourner Truth, which is a great woman. I'm not taking that away from her. You know, 
But we need to find our way back to ancient Egypt. We need to find our way back to ancient Egypt to claim our greatness. We need to claim that. We need to find our way back to our own personal spirituality. Do you understand that? Do you understand those two phases that I outlined for you? Then you are ready as a people to be liberated. Okay? Right. Now, um, I wrote this book. This is my latest book. Both books, The Historical Origin of Christianity and The Historical Origin of Islam, this is my latest book. Uh, I saw it yesterday for the very first time in its finished product. Okay. The Historical Origin of Islam. A very important book. You should buy the book and read the book and study that book. I'm not saying it to make money. Uh -uh, I don't need that. I'm saying it, it's a message in there for you, us as a people. That's all I write for. It's the African community in America and throughout the world. But now, uh, if you're ready to go into uh, Islam, Christianity, and I can touch on the historical origin of Judaism, I'm ready to do so. Is that what you want? Okay. Christianity is the world's first An oldest religion on earth, Christianity. Now you got to remember now, during the time of antiquity, the word antiquity means ancient times. There was no religion, no place on planet Earth. You had no religion. No religion. Okay. Your ancestors, our ancestors, ancient Egyptians. were taught by the universe. They were students of the universe. Today you have universities, is that correct? Where do you think they got the name for university? From the universe. They were the first students of the universe. They were used as human instruments, just like your mother and your father were used to bring each and every one of you into the world in human form. The ancient Egyptians were used as human instruments by the creator creatress. You notice I say creator creatress because that gives balance. That's cosmic balance. You see? It's cosmic balance. Like I tell the brothers, don't come up here and say hotep. That's one-sided, off balance. That's male. Bring the female. May I hotel? Female. They were used as human instruments to bring forth all of civilization for all of mankind. So everything that you see around you came from that culture and civilization. Are you following me? Everything that you use, paper, pen, ink, furniture, Living in brick buildings, eating utensils, mathematics, science, everything came from that one culture, the ancient Egyptians. See? That's what you have to understand that. That's, that's how come we are so great as a people, because our ancestors left us an immortal legacy for us to identify with to be great. See? I, you know, listen. Uh, I have a sweater, I mean a sweatshirt and a t-shirt that I wear that I made up personally. I didn't wear it tonight. But uh, some of those uh, t-shirts and sweatshirts I have made up, that's ready to go to touch head in front. Some of them have the, the pyramid and the sphinx there. You see? And 
Right across up here, across my chest, it says, I love my African ancestors, the ancient Egyptians. And I got it on my back. When I turn around, it hits me from the back. See? And I love my African ancestors, the ancient Egyptians. You see? I'm not playing. I'm serious. I used to have a, a, a museum in Chicago. I started the, the world's first ancient Egyptian museum put up that I know of by a descendant of the ancient Egyptians. I had it for 11 years right in Chicago. I'm serious. Now, what happened, things began to change and get off balance when the Europeans came into Egypt. When Alexander the Greek came into Egypt, he wanted our uh, ancestor to worship him in their institutions, their sacred institutions. Because when they came in, they saw all this great and grand and glorious civilization and culture that these Africans made. Wow. What the hell? How did they do this? He wanted to be a part of that. But in order to be a part of that, he had to be accepted into the ancient Egyptian sacred society. You see? He had to he had to sit on the throne of Isis. If you do not sit on the throne of Isis, you have no authority in ancient Egypt. Because sitting on the throne of Isis is sitting in the lap of Isis, on her lap. See? And that gave you the authority to be the pharaoh or the governor of ancient Egypt. You see that? And he wanted that. But they didn't accept foreigners into their priest society. So Ptolemy I, Lagi, his successor, as he died in 323, came and took over Egypt. And he became the ruler of, of, of ancient Egypt. And he wanted to get himself accepted into the priest society. And they didn't allow that. So what he did, he went and found a temple in Memphis, Egypt that took two of their gods, or their deities, Osiris and Apis, the bull representative of Ra, and made a composite of that, those two names, and gave this Greek Ptolemy the name of Osirapus or Serapus. You see? And when that happens, he says, okay, can I come into your sacred society now? He says, they said, no. Uh-uh. We do not allow foreigners into our sacred society because they handpicked their own African kind to come in in the first damn place. So what he did, he closed down all of the temples throughout Egypt, every one of them, except the one in Memphis, Egypt. And he confiscated all of their ancient Egyptian divine scroll manuscripts and housed them into that temple in Memphis, Egypt. See? See I'm talking about history now. Not tradition. History. Uh, his grandson, Ptolemy III, you get his one, in the year 240 B.C., built a temple in Alexandria, Egypt for the worship of Serapis. See? Now this image that we know today as Jesus Christ, that image was known as Serapis then. It's all in this book. See? And he built this temple in Alexandria, Egypt for the worship of the Serapis. And next to that temple, he built an annex building. You know what that annex building is called today? It's called the Great Library of Egypt. See? And he took all those divine scroll manuscripts 
from that temple in Memphis, Egypt, that his grandfather had put there, that he closed down all the temples throughout Egypt, and housed them right there in this library. And that's what made it the great library of Egypt. Not the damn lie that they tell you that Aristotle, the teacher of Alexander, wrote hundreds of books, and Alexander housed Aristotle's book in the great library. No, uh-uh. It's in the book. I'm telling you this one. Now, let's move a little further in history about this image that we know today as Jesus the Christ. You had two factions. You had the Melkite Coptic Egyptians. Those were the uh, Uncle Toms of antiquity. They were right there with the Greeks. That's above. And then you had the grassroots, exterior cops, like we are. See? The, 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 the Melkites wanted our grassroots, or us grassroots, Coptic Egyptians, to accept this image that we know today as Jesus Christ, then known as the Rapers. Wanted us to accept it. We said, no, uh-uh. No, 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 no. See? Now, I'm going to jump in history. We come up to the time of a, a Coptic Egyptian by the name of uh, Arius. Uh, we're going to come up to the time of the donation of Constantine. We're going to come up to the uh, time of the dynasty schismatic controversy. We're going to come up to the time of Arius. All three, the dynasty schismatic controversy, the donation of Constantine, and a strong statement by Arius, you know, you know what that happened? That brought about the Council of Nicaea I, or the Nicene Council, was called to come about. And that's in my book. I'm the only scholar that I know of that's telling you what caused and what brought about the Nicene Council. Those three historical events, the Dynasty Schismatic Controversy, the Donation of Constantine, and a strong statement by Arius, when uh, Constantine gave and enticed Sylvester I, a, 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 a Coptic Egyptian, to accept this image that we know today as Jesus Christ, then known as the Rapist, as God. When he enticed him to do that, says, if you accept this image, the Rapist, I will give you all of my imperial emblems I will put you in charge of all of the, your people, the Coptic Egyptians. In other words, I will make you the head HNIC. You know what that is, don't you? Okay, that's what he told me to do. So he accepted that. Arya said, no, no, no. Arya said that this image that you have accepted, Sylvester, is a created creature. Dissimilar from the father. Now, who is the father? The father is Osiris. You see? And you go back to the ancient Egyptian divine triad. Who is the father in that? Osiris. Right? Who is the mother? Isis, the Holy Hathor Kyle mother. Who is the son? Horace Jr., the S-U-N. See? This thing here is the S-O-N. See? They tell you that Jesus is the son of man. You ever heard that phrase? That's true. Man created this thing called Jesus the Christ. You see that? Because man cannot create anything with life in it by himself. So therefore, anything that man creates has to be a creature without life. So this thing was created that's known today as Jesus the Christ. And they call the, uh, the council called the Council of Nicaea I, or the Nicene Council, to, to, to come to order. In and at that council meeting, they went into the ancient Egyptian divine triad, and they took Horus Jr. out, the S-U-N, and they inserted this European image, the S-O-N, in there. You see that? Then you go up 51 years later, 381, 
to the next council meeting called the Council of Constantinople I. This is all history I'm talking about. At the Council of Nicaea I, they created what is known as the Homogeneous Creed or the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed goes like this. God the Father, God the Son, the same. You see? That's the Moses. That's the Nicene Creed. So in 381, at the Council of Constantinople I, this all happened in Turkey. See? Called the Middle East. That's, that's a misnomer because the Middle East is actually Northeast Africa. Part of the African continent. So at the Council of Constantinople I, they made the homogeneous creed of God the Father, God the Son, the creed of the Byzantine Roman Empire. Now, let's modulate a little further in history and come up to the third ecumenical council, the most important council meeting that has ever been called on planet Earth. That council meeting was called, why? Because... The monophysite, the monophysite is an individual who says that this Jesus the Christ has a Osiris-like spirit, but no human nature. Do you hear me? No human nature. That's their argument. So how does one get a human nature? You have to be born through the body of a female. So what these Melkite Uncle Toms did, they went right to the ancient Egyptian divine triad. And guess who they took out of that triad? Isis. Took Isis out of there. And they created another created creature called the Virgin Mary to replace Isis in the ancient Egyptian divine triad. Giving the created creature, the Virgin Mary, the title of Theotokos. The word Theotokos means the mother of God. God who? Some of this Serapis that is known to us today as Jesus the Christ. Then they took the two created creatures, Serapis, and the other created creature, the supposed mother, called Ice, I mean called uh, the Virgin Mary, with her title of Theotokos, and they amalgamated the two created creatures together. And when that happened, this is supposed to give this created creature, Serapis, known to us today as Jesus Christ, a human nature. You see that? Very clever. See? And when that happened, the Melkite Coptic Egyptian says that now, this is the anointed one. This is a, the Ochoristos. And those, remember now, those Coptic Egyptians were speaking Greek because the Greek language was forced on them. So in English, Christos means the Christ. Now this is the Christ. You see? Then you go up to the fourth council meeting, the Council of, uh, of Chalcedon. And what they did there, they tried to consummate what took place at the Council of Ephesus 20 years prior. So now we're going to end all argument about whether this uh, Christ has a, a human nature or not. We're going to end it. So they're supposed to have ended the argument at the Council of Chalcedon. And that, at the close of the Council of Chalcedon in 451, that was supposed to begin the very beginning history of Christianity. Because they call that Orthodox Christianity began. You see that? And then you go up to the, the fifth council meeting. All this is in my book, The Historical Origin of Christianity. You go up to that fifth council meeting, and you will find the building of the world's first Christian church. You know what the name of that church is? The Hagia Sophia. Now, if you ask a Christian, what depth of Christianity or what layer of Christianity that he may be in? You ask him about, have you ever heard of the church of Hagia Sophia? He said, no. Okay. Now, my wife, Arnetta, in 
the historical origin of Islam, wrote a profound chapter on what happened to the church of Hagia Sophia. Dynamite. So it, the church, the world's first Christian church, the Hagia Sophia, built in 532, finished five years later in 537, built by Justinian and his wife Theodora, the Byzantine emperor. But it was the Coptic Egyptians who built it. Because the Europeans are not about building no building. It was the Coptic Egyptians who built it. They designed the building. And uh, that building is still standing today. There it is right here. It's got four minarets on there today. But this picture here in the background is the church of Hagia Sophia. Built in Constantinople, Turkey. Okay? And, and, and built by those Africans, those, those, those Melkite Coptic Egyptians. Now, Coptic, the word Coptic Egyptian, you know what that means? A descendant of the ancient Egyptian. That's what the word Coptic means. So if you hear that word Coptic Egyptian, I'm talking about a descendant of the ancient Egyptian. You see? So they built it. And guess what? The, the Hagia Sophia not only became the world's first Christian church, it became the world's first university for the Europeans. That was his center of learning. Not what George G.M. James tell you that the, the, that the, uh, the Greeks studied with the ancient Egyptians. No! How can they study with the ancient Egyptians? They had no writing system. That's never been an institution that ever came out of Greece during the time of antiquity. The ancient Egyptians wouldn't take never took any foreigners into their sacred society. They handpicked their own African kind. If they took the Greeks in, they would have to teach the Greeks A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. They did not run the pentagon. So now, here you have the first university for Europeans. That's all in my book, Historical Origin of Christianity. Teaching the Europeans. And you know, the, 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 the teaching staff was made up of all male uh, Coptic Egyptian Africans. The Africans were their teachers. The Coptic Egyptians were their teachers. See? It was, it was, no, it was no Rome. didn't have no Vatican back then. The Vatican was created when they built St. Peter's Church in 1445 over the catacombs on the outskirts of Rome. That's the way it is today. That church, the, 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 the St. Peter's Basilica and the Vatican over there is only about 558 or 59 years old. That's all it is. 558 years old. That's all. The first seat of Christianity was in Africa, in the Hagia Sophia. It lasted. The Hagia Sophia fell, fell in 1453 when Muhammad II came in and, and took a cannon and blew holes in the double walled city of Constantinople and went in and, and took and seized Constantinople and seized the Hagia Sophia. This is history. But between these two books, you'll get that information. Now, here comes Islam. Dun, 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 dun. Islam. Christianity, there's never been a man that ever walked the earth in human form of any race, creed, or color by the name of Jesus Christ. Never existed. Now, I have a $5,000 award to give to anybody of any race, creed, or color, including the Pope, that can repudiate me when I say there's never been a Jesus Christ of any race, creed, or color. But you have to write it up in a repudiating manuscript. Don't walk up to me and tell me about what you believe and what you have faith in and try to use your emotions to make what you believe and have faith in right. I didn't do that in my book, Historical Origins of Christianity. There's not one biblical reference in that book. Not one. So you have to use the discipline of history like I did. Use the discipline of history. Put down how, why, and when did Jesus Christ 
walk the earth and where it came from and so forth and so on. Tell me. Write it up. And you can get your $5,000. I'll be glad to give you $5,000. But you can't do it. You know why they can't do it? That, that challenge has been out there for 10 years. You know why they can't? They won't take it. Nobody can take it. I mean, including the Pope. You know why? Because you cannot, you cannot take your belief in what you have faith in and write it on paper using uh, the discipline of history to prove that a Jesus Christ walked this earth. You can't do that. Now, I have the same thing, same award to be given to anybody from the race, people, color. What I'm saying, in this book, there's never been a man that ever walked the earth in human form by the name of the Prophet Muhammad of tradition. Never existed. Okay? Now, when I was saying that about the Christians, the Muslims said, yeah, you're, you're right, man. Yeah, brother. As soon as I said about the Prophet Muhammad, they have a baby with a bonnet. <laughs> they jump up like cheetah. Remember little cheetah in Tarzan? They jump up like cheetah. You know what I mean? What do you mean? You know, you're crazy. You know, and all that little kind of stuff. You know, I was giving a lecture one day in Chicago, and the brother, he was a Muslim. He said, I stand this no Prophet Muhammad. He said, You should be ashamed of yourself telling these people all these lies. I said, Okay, young man. I said, I'll Tell you what you do. You come down and get up on the podium, and you point out what lies I'm telling to the people, and you put what's right in its place. You don't see, I can tell you that you're wrong, but I'm going to put something what's right in its place. He said, That's it, isn't it? I can't say, Oh, you're wrong, and leave it at that. Why am I wrong? Okay, what do you have to say that I'm wrong? What do you have to put in this place? I ask it, I ask it, uh, call him a Negro. You know what I mean? I'll tell you what my definition of a Negro is. I, he, I asked him four times. I said, come on up here. He wouldn't do it. And he got mad and he called me a nigger and walked out. <laughs> I became a nigger. <laughs> okay, fine. But anyway, here we have this faceless white man on a, on a, on a camel called the Prophet Muhammad. And in this book, I walk you through why there's no Muhammad. Now, I'm going to tell you something that may shock you. Islam, I want you to understand this now very carefully. Islam is a religion that's based upon a book called the Quran. If you do not have the book called the Quran, you cannot have Islam. Simple as that. You see? Now, before the book called Islam came about, there was Mohammedanism. See that? But not Islam. See? But they, the Muslims don't, they, they want to investigate. Now, they, they believe that the angel Gabriel taught the prophet Muhammad <laughs> the Quran. I told you about that, didn't I? Right. Both been in the, in, 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 in the seventh century. Okay? Now, Islam, like I said before, is a religion based upon a book called the Quran. Without the Quran, you have no Islam. Do you know when the Quran was first created? Then you're going back, you, 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 if you said 642, then you're saying that there was a uh, Muhammad. Never been a Muhammad. That's tradition says that. Okay? The Quran was created, began in, in 1870 in the region of Northeast Africa called Syria. See that? And it, it was finished. 49 years later and accepted by the Mohammedan world in 1919. This is history. I'm not talking no tradition. I don't deal with tradition. No such thing as A.D. A.C.E. See, A.D. means, if I said yes, then I would, I would be saying that that was a Jesus Christ. They said, I know Domini, after the death of our Lord. No, I'm not saying that. A.C.E., after 50 years. Okay? 
finished in 1919, 49 years later, accepted by the, the Mohammedan world. Okay? You know who created the Quran? I want you to listen. Is everybody listening? Huh? They created Islam. Yes. What did I say? You, how did you get Islam? You got to have what? Quran. In the Quran, you go and get your Quran, there's two bodies of literature in the Quran. One, the first body, is, is the Pentateuch of the Old Testament, or it's the first five books of Moses. All meaning the same thing. The Pentateuch, first five books of Moses, and the Old Testament is one and the same. And then you have Psalms in there. In, this is in, this is in the, uh, the Quran now. You understand that? Okay? And the second body of literature is the four Gospels. Huh? Is that true? Now, let's begin to use our analytical mind. Okay? Let's begin to study history. First place, let's go back. Remember this now. Judaism is not a B.C. religion. I'm going to repeat that. Judaism is not a B.C. religion. You following me? You cannot predate Judaism past Solomon bar Isaac called Rashi. We're talking about the, the, the late 11th and early 12th century when he formulated the protocol for what we know today as Judaism. This is history. Third, you cannot predate Judaism past the first crusade of 1096. Can't do it. Now here you have a Quran with Jewish writings and Christian writings in it. Is that right? Let's use your analytical mind. They said that, you heard about the story I told you about the angel Gabriel dictating to Muhammad. And Muhammad's birthday, according to tradition, is supposed to have been 570 A.D. Is that right? And he's supposed to have died in, in 632 A.D. Is that right? That's tradition. Okay? They say he was born in Mecca. Now, and died in Medina. Is that right? Okay. Let's go back. If you go and get a shorter encyclopedia of Islam, I don't know if you heard of that. I got, got an encyclopedia of Islam called the Shorter Encyclopedia of Islam. And when you look up Muhammad in there, they tell you that there's no biography for a Muhammad. Isn't that interesting? And guess what else they tell you? Go a little further. They said that they have no record and no data of Muhammad ever living in Mecca. They don't have no data for that. No record. This is what the short encyclopedia of Islam is saying. I just said this. I'm just a researcher. I'm bringing to my African community information that is vitally needed at this time in history so I can help you divest yourself from all these foolish religions. You see that? You say they don't have no data of, of Muhammad living in Mecca. Now, without Muhammad being living in Mecca or born in Mecca, what happens? You have no, you have no Muhammad. You have no Mecca. Because there was no Mecca. Okay? We'll get to that a little later. Now, let's go back. They said this Quran was created after the angel Gabriel had dictated to the prophet Muhammad what God wanted Muhammad to pass on to the people. This was done in the 7th century. In the 7th century, there was no Jews, so therefore, no Old Testament, right? Because the Old Testament comes from the Judaism. Huh? Let's think now. In the 7th century, there was Christ 
was there being worshipped. It was never been a Christ, but Christianity was there. But then in the seventh century, Christianity did not have any, any written literature. It had no written literature in the seventh century. Written literature for Christianity came about in the 16th century, created by a man by the name of Desiderius Erasmus, a Roman, ex-Roman Catholic priest, a playwright of his time, a homosexual. Now, I didn't, I'm not criticizing, it was history is saying that he was a homosexual, so I'm not a homophobic. So if any of you guys in here got a broke wrist, don't get mad at me. Okay? <laughs> but anyway, Erasmus was a fag. Okay? <laughs> this is true. And he was commissioned in 1500 by Pope Alexander VI to write something on the object of Christianity. What's the object of Christianity? It's Jesus the Christ. You see that? And he, he came out 16 years later, in 1516, with, with the Novum Instrumentum. That's my book. You have to read it. The Novum. Novum Instrumentum. Okay? The Novum Instrumentum contains three Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. They always told you that John came later. Is that correct? Okay, John did come later. You know when John came? In the King James Version in 1611. That's when the fourth gospel appeared. See, I'm not talking tradition to you. I'm talking history. Erasmus created what is known as the synoptic gospel or Q literature. QLA literature means the source. And he created six other chapters to go into the Novum Instrumentum. Those six other chapters are 1 and 2 Peter, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and Epistle to the Romans. That's what he wrote, nine manuscripts. In, in, in 1519, they changed it from the Novum Instrumentum to the Novum Testamentum. In 1535, they changed it to the New Testament. That's how you got it. Okay? Now, in the meantime, you had no Jewish literature until when? Until Judaism came out. See? The, the first five books of Moses was created by Moses Maimon called Mamonides. He was the one that created that. You see? In, in 1168 to 1180. This is history I'm talking about. See? All right? So now, where does, where does this leave Muhammad, according to tradition? Something's wrong, isn't it? When you pick up the Quran, there you got these two bodies of literature. You got the Jewish Pentateuch and the Psalm, and you got the four Christian, Christian Gospels in there. Four Christian Gospels, right here in the Quran. But they're going to tell you about the angel Gabriel. You know how they get away with that? Because you will not ask questions. You just believe. You know how they get away with that? Because you won't investigate nothing. You see, now, you see, when you go to church and you sit in the pews, you don't even have to think. Just to think. Nothing for you to think. You already believe that. I ask you, do you believe in God? They ask you, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? You say, yeah. So hell, you don't have to think. You just sit there and listen. Okay? Reverend Chicken Wing, he don't have to think either because all he got to do is pick up his old raggedy Bible. Huh? And everything is prepared for him in the Bible. All he, got, all he got to do is embellish it and tell more lies to it. Yeah, that's right. He got his choir. Mm -hmm. You know, oh yeah, well. Huh? All that old kind of foolishness. Emotional foolishness. See? Now, you got a, you got a paper and a pen. Huh? I want you to take your paper and pen out. And I want you to, to, to write the word Bible. 
And for all those who don't know how to spell Bible, it's spelled B-I-B-L-E. Okay? I know you all go to college now. I'm only having fun with you guys, okay? At the same time, we, we're learning things. Now, everybody got Bible down? Take the two B's away. And what do you have? I, L, and the E. Is that right? Put the I between the L and the E, and what you got? That's what the Bible is, a damn lie. Okay? That's right before your face. You see? So here you have a Quran created by Jews. So if the Quran and the religion called Islam is based on the Quran, in order for Islam to come about, you have to have a Quran that was created by Jews. You know where they came from? They came from the, the alliance, Israelite, universal of Paris, France. That's where they came from. They were Jewish scholars and Jewish rabbis that came over there in the Syrian area to create literature for the Arab world. The Arabs are so dense up here, that they can't even create literature for themselves. They can't even create a religion for themselves. They let the Jews do that. And then the Jews incorporate all three religions <laughs> into all of that. So it's about Ishmael and Abraham and all that other kind of foolishness. And they believe it. They sit up there and believe it. And, 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 and every day, they pray five times a day. 